thank you all for coming out tonight and giving me the opportunity to talk to a somewhat different group of people from the, the people I normally talk to our scientific results, uh, talk to about our scientific results. Um, so I wanted to start by, uh, as Bruce uh, mentioned in his, in his introduction, by, by talking a little bit uh, about the, the New York Times. Um, those of you who read the uh, New York Times Science page or the Washington Post or the Guardian or look at National Geographic or any of these other publications will have seen headlines like this. This is a very nice article that came out about a year ago by uh, one of the best science writers in the area of evolution, Carl Zimmer, about uh, reconstructing the tree of life. And if you were to click through and look at that article, you would see an image uh, that looks like this, uh, showing the uh, evolutionary relationships among 3,000 different uh, species sampled from across the globe. Um, and if you look closely at this picture, you'll see that most of this tree is made up of single-celled organisms, bacteria, uh, and uh, primitive single-celled organisms called archaea. And the organisms that we know best, uh, including uh, animals, plants, and fungi, uh, are all down in this little tiny corner here. And the animals that we identify with the most, such as vertebrates and, and mammals are, are so small that they don't even get a label on this graph. So some of these pictures are quite remarkable. You can see from this picture that everything traces back to a single uh, universal ancestor of all living things that would have lived about 3.5 billion years ago, as best we can tell from the fossil record and from genetic analysis. If you continued to look through these uh, sorts of uh, popular publications, you'd see a number of different articles about evolution. Dinosaur evolution, uh, evolution of influenza, uh, fruit fly evolution and the way that natural selection influences fruit flies, evolution of lice, um, uh, co-evolution in, in mammals and dinosaurs, and of course many articles about human evolution. Uh, the evolution of mountain populations and their adaptations to high altitude. Uh, the population of Australia and uh, of the Americas. Um, and then, of course, many articles about one of my favorite topics, Neanderthals. And one of these articles uh, actually describes a paper that we published a little more than a year ago, and I'm going to tell you about that today. Um, now, of course, if you're less selective about your sources, <laughs> you might encounter some articles like this one, uh, which happens also to be about our paper. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, this is an, an actual news report in the, in the Huffington Post. Uh, talk about a coarsening of public discourse. It's uh, rather embarrassing. And this is even before the Trump era. Um, <laughs> all right, but what I want to talk about today is how do we actually know this stuff? These findings are obviously astonishing. Um, these stories about human evolution, about dinosaurs, about the tree of life. But how can we figure this sort of thing out from modern day evidence? Um, the short answer I'm going to give you is a term called molecular phylogenetics, where phylogenetics comes from the term phylogeny introduced by Ernst Teckel in the mid 19th century, a German biologist. Essentially means genesis and evolution of a phylum or a branch of life. Um, and molecular refers to the analysis of DNA sequences for the most part these days, but also protein sequences, the sequences of amino acids that make up proteins, RNA sequences, and other uh, biomolecules. And so in, in this talk tonight, I'm going to try to give you a sense for what this field is, uh, how it developed over the last 50 years or so, and then toward the end of the talk, what it can tell us about our own ancestry and our relationship to Neanderthals. So like any good academic, I'll start by establishing my credibility. Um, so I've been studying uh, molecular phylogenetics for a long time. I got very interested in this topic right after college in the early 1990s when I was working at Los Alamos National Labs studying HIV. And I discovered this whole world of making use of computers to, uh, to reconstruct the past and became fascinated by it. Over time, we've published uh, papers describing the evolutionary relationships among cultivated plants. We've described uh, processes by which bacteria transfer DNA from one strain to another. This is a process called horizontal transfer. 
We've studied uh, complex families of genes that evolve by duplication and loss, as well as through speciation. We've studied small RNAs in fruit flies and many, many other topics. But there's a collection of uh, core techniques that we've used again and again throughout these sorts of analyses. And they rely on modeling the evolution of, of DNA sequences along the branches of an evolutionary tree or a phylogeny. And so I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about how this area came about um, and, and how it works. Um, so no uh, talk about phylogenetics would be complete without this slide. How many of you have seen this picture? All right, quite a few, may, maybe 20% or so. This is a, fa a famous image. It's claimed to be the first phylogeny. This is actually uh, drawn by Charles Darwin in his uh, famous notebook B about 1837. So that's 20 years before The Origin of Species was even published. So he was doodling in his notebooks pictures of evolutionary trees. And he, he realized as soon as he started to think about these processes by which one species would evolve from another, that this would give rise to a branching structure um, where, uh, where more primitive organisms were at the base of the tree. And as you got closer to the tips, you approached the present day. And you would, you would have a series of branching uh, operations that would lead to uh, a, a kind of a family tree among all living species today. Um, Darwin was still quite taken with this idea by the time he published On the Origin of Species. And this is actually the single figure in, in that book. If you flip to the very back, it's not even numbered, because there's only one figure in the book. It's mostly text. If you go to the very back, you'll see this image here. It's this, the single figure in The Origin of Species. And uh, at times, Darwin spoke. Uh, rather poetically about this uh, image of the tree. He talked about how limbs divided into great branches were themselves once when the tree was small, budding twigs, and so on and so forth. He wasn't the first one to think in terms of trees. You can see the image of the tree. You can see precursors of this idea of the tree in the work of Linnaeus and Lamarck and others. But Darwin was the first one to sort of unify this idea of evolution with a tree. Um, and, and realized that it would imply that all life on Earth uh, was uh, related by a single tree. So for many years, biologists tried to build trees. But not having DNA sequences, they had to work with observable traits. Um, and this was, was an area that became known as cladistics. Biologists would identify particular characters, um, uh, phenotypic characters, um, morphological characters in organisms and try to come up with branching relationships that would, that would only require those characteristics to emerge once. So for example, they, they imagine that a vertebral column would emerge once and that would separate a lamprey from uh, a lancelet. Uh, and then jaws would emerge once and they would separate a tuna from a lamprey and so on and so forth. And in that way, they were able to get a pretty good idea of what the tree of life might look like. But of course, there were many difficult to resolve evolutionary questions, parts of the tree that were difficult to work out because there weren't good characteristics, physical characteristics that separated one group of organisms from another. So the, the key development that people uh, tend to point back to in the emergence of uh, molecular phylo phylogenetics is an observation uh, by Linus Pauling and Ernst, Zu uh, uh, sorry, Emil Zuckerkondel in the early 60s who were studying um, the hemoglobin protein. And they were looking at hemoglobin proteins that they had sequenced from various different species. And they knew something about the evolutionary relationships about these species and about how long ago they must have diverged based on the fossil record. And they noticed that the numbers of differences in these amino acid sequences were, were roughly proportional to the uh, estimated evolutionary time since these species have diverged. So they introduced this idea of a molecular clock, of a clock that's ticking over time, laying down new mutations on, uh, on these amino acid sequences. And those, sequences, those mutations are accumulating over time so that things that are more distantly related have more mutations between them, and things that are more closely related have fewer mutations between them. <laughs> 
So their idea looks something like this. You would have a gene in some ancestral species. That species would split through some sort of speciation event into two daughter species. Maybe one group of organisms in the population would migrate to the other side of the river and stop interacting with the other uh, subset of, of that species. And over time, they would diverge from one another into two subspecies. And then those subspecies would begin to accumulate mutations separately. And so now if you were to compare a protein from one of them with a protein of another, you might see that there were two mutations unique to this one and two mutations unique to this one. But now as time goes on, more mutations would be accumulated and perhaps additional speciation events would occur. And you'd have more and more differences accumulating between the proteins that were present in these individual species. So now if you looked at the protein from species B and species C, they would only differ at a few places, but the proteins for B and C would differ from the protein from species A in many more locations. And in this way, you could start to imagine reconstructing an evolutionary tree by counting up the numbers of differences in these proteins. That was the, the core idea introduced by uh, Zucker, Condell, and Pauling. So if you look at modern day data for proteins, uh, for a particular protein, in this case the cytochrome C protein, from a number of different organisms, in this case we're focusing on a number of mammals, and you, uh, you plot the estimated number of years since those two species diverged from a common ancestor, as estimated from the, uh, the fossil record, against the number of substitutions, in this case they're going to be DNA substitutions rather than amino acid substitutions, but the principle is the same. You would see over time an approximately linear relationship between those two properties. And in this way, these mutations can be thought of as a kind of a clock that we can use to date the time since things diverged and also to reconstruct the shapes of the evolutionary trees that uh, describe their relationships. So uh, Zucker, Condell, and Pauling's observations were, were really just sort of empirical. They just noticed this property of proteins. They didn't really give a recipe for how to reconstruct the phylogeny from this sort of data. Um, but a few years later, this became a very active area of research. And one of the pioneers in this area was the uh, Italian uh, human geneticist, Luca Cavalli Sforza. Uh, who collaborated closely with a, a British statistician, Anthony Edwards, and they came up with the first recipes for using this sort of data to reconstruct a tree that would show how closely uh, different organisms were related and how long ago they might have diverged. So over the next 10 years or so, there were a large number of different uh, types of techniques proposed for reconstructing these trees. I want to show you what one of them looks like. This turns out to be one of the most intuitive and easy to understand, um, and also one of the most powerful techniques for reconstructing evolutionary relationships. It's called parsimony, because it, it tries to find an evolutionary history that minimizes the number of changes required to explain the observed data. And I'll show you what I mean by that as we go forward. Imagine we have three species, one, two, and three. And for simplicity, let's imagine we know uh, their ancestral sequence. Maybe we can infer it by looking at a distant re distantly related relative. And we want to find what the evolutionary relationship is among species 1, 2, and 3. Let's focus first on just one variable position in those sequences. This is known as a site in the literature. So at this particular position, species 1 and 2 have a C, and species 3 has an A. And now we're going to consider that there are three possible evolutionary relationships among those three species. Either one and two could be most closely related with three as an outgroup, or one and three could be most closely related with two as an outgroup, or two and three could be most closely related with one as an outgroup. Those are the only possible relationships among three species. And now let's try to imagine the minimal sequence of mutations that could explain the observed data if we assume that there's an A at the root of the tree. Well, if there's an A at the root of the tree, then we ex can explain this data under the first tree by just one mutation from an A to a C 
along this branch leading to species one and two. Does everybody see that? If there were a mutation there, it would lead to a shared C in species one and two, while species three would still have an A. If we try to explain the same data using species two or three, we can only do it with a minimum of two mutations. Re requires two mutations to explain this pattern under species, under, under tree two, and it requires two under tree three. Now that doesn't necessarily mean species, uh, tree two or tree three are wrong. There are gonna be cases where there are multiple mutations that happen at a site. But if we systematically see across all positions in the data that one tree is supported more than the others, that gives us a strong belief that that must be the true evolutionary relationship among those species. And in this case, if we look at the other sites, sites two, three, and four, and similarly try to match them up with the tree, I'm not gonna go through all the details. If we do that, we find that actually None of, the, none of these sites strongly supports one tree over the other. They all require five mutations across these three sites to explain. But if we had a large number of sites, we could add them up and we could say, what's the total number of events required under each of these trees in order to explain the observed data? In this case, we get six events under tree one, seven events under tree two, and seven events under tree three. So that gives us some confidence that tree one is most consistent with the data. Now in this case, maybe not a whole lot of confidence. Maybe this is not the greatest example, but in real examples, we would hope we would look at hundreds or thousands of sites and see many, many dozens or many hundreds of cases where you prefer one species or one tree over the other, okay? And in practice, that's what people do when they analyze these data. So here's an example, this is a famous example. So one of those cases that I mentioned where uh, morphological characters uh, were, were difficult to resolve a, a question of evolutionary relationships is the case of the great apes. So the, in particular, the question of whether humans, homo sapiens, are more closely related to chimpanzees, pantroglodytes, or gorillas, gorilla, gorilla. And this was a problem that uh, a plague taxonomists for many years because there are many derived traits among all three of those organisms and it wasn't clear which two were more closely related than the other. So by the, the late 1980s, Morris Goodman and his group had obtained quite a lot of sequence data for the time, tens of thousands of DNA nucleotides from each of these species. Um, this was in the area of the beta globin gene and they used those to perform this sort of parsimony analysis that I just told you about. And what they found was that they, uh, the best tree was the one that I'm showing here that groups humans and chimps uh, with gorillas as an outgroup. And that tree required 383 different substitution events, nucleotide mutations, and they mapped those to the branches of the tree. And there are quite a few, not a huge number, but a significant number that support that grouping of humans and chimps. So these are mutations that are shared by humans and chimps and not shared by the other great apes, right? And this gave them quite a lot of confidence that this was the true evolutionary relationship among these species. Another one of my favorite examples, also sort of a classic in the phylogenetic literature, has to do with the cetacea, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So as many of you know, whales are mammals but it's not obvious how they relate to other mammals because they're morphologically so distinct. They're so highly diverged from other mammals. So this was a problem that plagued taxonomists for many years as well. Um, and, and a number of papers in the late 90s, most notably this one by a Japanese group in 1999, obtained sequence data from uh, toothed whales and baleen whales along with many other mammals and they showed very clearly that the closest relatives of mammals were hippopotamuses. Uh, so this was quite striking. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the whales, uh, dolphins, and porpoises uh, trace their ancestry to an ancestor of hippopotamuses about 50 million years ago. And this is something that is now fairly well supported by the fossil record as well. It appears that this, uh, this evolutionary divergence happened um, in and on the Indian subcontinent, uh, actually started probably with a terrestrial mammal, um, and, uh, and, and sometime later 
um, they made their way into the ocean. So the fact that hippopotamuses are, uh, are, are aquatic as well is a, an example of convergent evolution. They, it's believed from the fossil record that their ancestors were terrestrial. OK. Um, another great figure from the early days of molecular phylogenetics was a guy named Alan Wilson. And um, I want to focus uh, on Wilson in particular here because he was especially interested in the evolution of humans and of uh, the great apes. Uh, and he was a, a very prolific author throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and one of the pioneers in obtaining sequence data from humans and other uh, apes and finding out the relationships among those individuals. Um, he also is important in that he trained a number of important people in this field, including Svante Pabo, who's a person I'm going to tell you about a little bit later, one of the pioneers in Neanderthal uh, DNA sequencing. Ellen Wilson also trained uh, Mary Claire King, who's the discoverer of the BRCA1 breast cancer gene, which some of you might have heard of. So he's a very influential uh, person in uh, genetics and evolution during this period. Actually, if you look closely, you can see in this picture here, he's drawing molecular clock pictures. This, this is cytochrome C, there's hemoglobin, and there are a few others. He's drawing, drawing these pictures like the one I just showed you about how as time goes on, proteins diverge in a roughly linear fashion. So uh, Wilson and his colleagues, Re Rebecca Can and Mark Stone King, uh, published a very important paper also in the late 80s, this time in Nature. Um, uh, this was really the first large-scale study of uh, human evolution based on mitochondrial DNA. So they collected uh, 147 uh, samples from 147 different people from around the world, sequenced their mitochondrial DNA, and then built a big evolutionary tree using parsimony methods, like the ones I just told you about, describing how those individuals were related. Um, you can't see what I'm showing you there, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit on a subset of these individuals. What they found was that uh, they looked at multiple populations from around the world, African, Africans, Asians, Australians, Europeans. What they found was that most of these non-African groups, such as the Europeans, formed uh, clades. They formed clusters on the trees that they were able to reconstruct. But the Africans almost invariably fell outside of the variation in these non-African subgroups. And that's very, very strongly suggested that Africa was the original source of human genetic diversity, and that these various groups had emerged out of Africa sometime after the African diversity had already been established. And this has been supported now, as I'll show you, by many, many subsequent studies. In general, we see much greater evolutionary divergence, uh, di diversity within Africa than we see in these non-African populations. Um, and these typically represent subsets of the genetic diversity that had been present in Africa and then moved out, possibly in multiple colonizations. You can see in their abstract, they actually mention multiple origins for non-African populations. And we'll see later in my talk that that's something that um, has persisted to the day uh, and something that our work um, uh, tends to support. Um, another, uh, another piece of this study was they obtained an estimated date for the divergence of all of these populations. And they estimated at about 200,000 years ago. That turns out to be a date that also holds up pretty well. We'll come back to that as the talk goes on. So this led to the, the terminology mitochondrial Eve. Some of you may have heard of this. Uh, that the idea is that all people on Earth can trace their maternal uh, inheritance back to one woman who lived in Africa about 200,000 years ago, and she would be mitochondrial Eve. So I neglected to tell you, some of you may know this, but the, but the mitochondrial DNA is, is inherited from your mother only. From, it's a maternally inherited molecule, whereas most of your DNA is inherited from both parents. So when you reconstruct the history of human populations using mitochondrial DNA, you're reconstructing only your maternal history. So this, these results referred only to that. All right, so throughout the, um, uh, the 1990s, people continued to work uh, hard on these phylogenetic methods for understanding 
human populations. Um, and a particular pioneer in this area was uh, this guy, Luca Cavalli Sforza, who I mentioned earlier as one of the pioneers of uh, developing phylogenetic methods. By this time, he was at Stanford. Um, and he carried out a very ambitious research program, uh, traveling around the world, obtaining samples from people, and studying them using phylogenetic methods, including mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosomal DNA, and DNA from the rest of the genome. Um, and he also was a pioneer in um, uh, comparing and contrasting his genetic findings with what could be found uh, through the study of linguistics and through the study of cultures. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and he, he wrote a, a very important book, I think it came out in 1994, uh, that really captured the state of the field at that time. I'm not going to go through these individual papers, but I'm going to instead give you a summary of about what was known about human evolution uh, around 2000. This is actually taken from a, a review article by Cavalli Sforza and his colleague Mark Feldman from 2003. So, at this time, roughly 15 years ago, um, uh, it was uh, essentially established um, to, their, to their best guess, using the data they had available, that uh, anatomically modern humans had emerged probably in East Africa, although there were some that argued for South Africa, around 200,000 years ago, and that by about 100,000 years ago, these groups had begun to split and spread out across the African continent and give rise to the different African uh, populations that we see today. For example, the, ba the Bantu of northern and western Africa and the San of southern Africa. And then by around 60 or 70,000 years ago, one or more waves of migration occurred off of the African continent. These early humans began to populate the rest of the world through several different paths. There was at least one southern uh, migration to the east, at least one northern migration to the east, and at least one migration to the west. There are quite early remains in Australia going back as, as long as 60,000 years ago, and there are uh, remains in China of anatomically modern humans that also go back 60,000 years. So these were quite early uh, uh, colonizations. The evidence in Europe was for us a, a slightly later colonization, about 40,000 years ago. And then, of course, the population of the New World was considerably later, required crossing the Bering Land Bridge, probably 15 to 20,000 years ago. Uh, and again, this appears uh, from subsequent work to have occurred in multiple waves rather than in one wave of colonization. All right, so this was essentially what was known at that time. Um, and then, around 2008 or so, uh, this game really began to change dramatically. And it really changed because of DNA sequencing technologies. So, so a, a, a new uh, type of technology for obtaining DNA sequences very, very cheaply and in very high volumes began to emerge in the mid-2000s. Uh, and it became clear that we could start to obtain complete genome sequences from individuals across the globe. And the culmination of this effort was a project called the Thousand Genomes Project, uh, which has now obtained very high quality complete genome sequences for several thousand uh, humans from multiple populations from, from across the globe. And as this became possible, it became clear that we no longer had to restrict ourselves in these sorts of studies to mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosomal DNA. We could study complete genome sequences for humans and use those to try to understand our evolutionary history. All right. So that sounds good. More data is usually good. But it turns out that in this case, more data leads to some significant complications. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a, a sense for how this problem becomes more difficult when you look across the entire genome rather than looking, say, just at the mitochondrial genome or just at the Y chromosome, which are inherited as units, Y chromosomes paternally and mitochondrial DNA maternally. OK. So one issue is that we have two copies of every chromosome. So if you look at my, one of my genes, say my hemoglobin gene, I have a copy that I inherited from my mother and a copy that I inherited from my father. 
And those copies have different evolutionary histories in the same way that my mother and my father have different evolutionary histories. So if we look at a collection of um, individual chromosomes from modern day individuals, we're going to count backwards in time, so time zero is the present day. Now we can think of each individual as having two tips in that tree, right? So the blue individual has a tip here and a tip there. One is the maternal copy and one is the paternal copy of the particular gene that we're looking at. Same for the green individual and same for the purple individual. We can then trace backwards in time and build a phylogeny for all of those in, for, for, for all of those individual chromosomes, but it's no longer at the level of individuals, it's now at the level of chromosomes. Okay, so that's one complication. If I build an evolutionary tree for a single gene in the genome, I have to keep track of the fact that each individual has two copies of that gene. When it gets really complicated is when we think about the problem of recombination. So some of you might remember from your high school biology class, and it's okay if you don't, that when, uh, your, uh, w when your cells go through a process called meiosis, the process of cell division that leads to uh, sperm and egg cells, that the paternal and the maternal chromosomes swap genetic material with one another. So if this is the paternal and this is the maternal chromosomes, they cross over and some material from the maternal chromosome ends up on the paternal chromosome and vice versa. And that happens every generation on every chromosome, essentially. What that means is that over time, the different genes on a chromosome will have different evolutionary histories. If I look at my hemoglobin gene, it's going to have one evolutionary history, a different one from my mother and from my father but one evolutionary history for each of those. If I then go to my cytochrome C gene, because it's in a different location on the genome and things have been shuffled by the process of recombination, it's going to have a different evolutionary history. So at every position along the genome, I'll have a different tree describing the relationships among the chromosomes um, at that position. Now this turns out to be good and bad. It's bad in that it makes things very complicated to study. When I try to reconstruct evolutionary trees from population samples of humans, I have to deal with this nasty problem of the tree changing as I go along the chromosome. But it's good in that I'm actually sampling a much larger portion of my ancestry. Remember, with the Y chromosome, I'm only looking down one lineage. I'm looking at my father, my father's father, my father's father's father, and so on. I'm only looking down one lineage of all my possible ancestors. Similarly, with mitochondrial genome. In this case, at every locus, I'm sampling a different set of ancestors because things have been swapped around in different ways by this process of recombination. So it potentially gives me a lot more information about my ancestry, a lot more information about how long ago different populations might have diverged, a lot more information about gene flow between populations, as we'll see in a moment, and more information about how large ancestral populations might have been. So let me talk a little bit about this issue of gene flow, because that's where I'm trying to take you with this whole study, just like the Huffington Post said. Um, so imagine that we have two completely genetically isolated populations. Let's say they, they, they live on separate islands and they don't have any technology for getting between the islands. And they diverged some number of generations ago that we'll call tau. Now if I sample an individual from each of those populations at a single locus and I trace them back, then they're going to find some common ancestor. And that common ancestor will vary from one position along the genome to the next because of historical recombination, just as I was telling you. But if it's true that those two populations have been completely isolated genetically, then it has to be at least as old as tau, right? When I find their common ancestry, when I trace back to their common ancestry, to their common ancestor, it has to be in this ancestral population before the two were were isolated from one another. However, if there has been some gene flow between those two populations, if some, some of these guys have been 
finding rafts and sneaking over to these guys, right? Then I'm going to I'm going to have some places along the genome where their common ancestry is younger than the split between the two populations. All right? So if I look across the genome at many different locations and I see that most of the ancestry is old, but there's an occasional position along the genome with very recent ancestry, that's a telltale sign of gene flow between two populations, right? And that is essentially the signal that we look for when we study these ancient interbreeding events. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to have to start to skip over some details because the methods that we actually use get fairly complicated. But I want to tell you at a, at a high conceptual level essentially what we're doing. So my group got interested in this problem uh, about seven or eight years ago. Um, and we were, uh, we wanted to model this problem of finding common ancestry along complete genomes, allowing for it to change, for the patterns of ancestry to change from one position in the genome to the next. So we set it up in the following way. We, we collect DNA sequences for many locations across the genome. We have a representative, one or more representatives of several populations. We propose some branching relationship among those populations. We can try several if we're not sure what it is, but sometimes we have enough information from the fossil record that we have a pretty good idea of what that relationship is. So for example, if these were Europeans and uh, West Africans, then these might be South Africans. We know essentially from other studies that that's their general relationship with one another. And then using the computer, we explore many, many population trees consistent with the data across the genome. And we adjust the parameters of this model, the time since these populations diverged and the amounts of gene flow between populations until they best fit the data. We do that by exploring millions of these possible genealogies across tens of thousands of DNA sequences drawn from the genome. And we make use of techniques drawn from statistical physics called Monte Carlo techniques that let us in a principled way explore the space of possible genealogies. And at the end of the day, the computer gives us a model and it tells us which model best fits the data and how much confidence we have in the individual parameters of that model. All right. And some of these genealogies will, will involve gene flow between populations and others won't. And we can turn a knob. There's a parameter that describes how much of that gene flow there is. So we can test the possibility of gene flow or the possibility of not having gene flow. Okay. So the reason we were particularly interested in this was we had some collaborators um, in about 2009, published in 2010, who obtained complete genome sequences from some Southern African representatives. In particular, we were interested in this complete genome sequence for a repre representative of this um, hunter-gatherer population from the Kalahari Desert, known as the Khoisan or the San. Um, and the early work by Cavalli Sforza and others had shown uh, from mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosomal DNA, that the San seemed to be a very early branching group, probably the earliest branching group of all living populations on Earth today. But the data was, was very sparse and it was limited to paternal or maternal histories. So we set out to see whether we could figure out how old this population was by using these statistical sampling techniques across the entire genome. I think I forgot to tell you the name of our program. The name of our program is um, GFOX. It stands for Generalized Phylogenetic Coalescence Sampler. So we wanted to apply GFOX to these data and see what we could say about how old the son were. So the way we did this was we took, at the time, there were only a few complete genome sequences for multiple uh, uh, populations acro across the globe, but we had a Korean individual, a Han Chinese individual, a European individual, a West African Yoruban individual, and a, a San individual. And we uh, assumed the following 
the, the tree that I'm showing here, this was based on Cavalli Sforza's data and other data. We could also test alternative trees and make sure that this was the one that fit the data best. And we allowed for gene flow between some of these populations. And then we tried to see whether we could estimate how old these splits were between the different groups. And we focused in particular on two splits. The split between the SON and the others. That was the one I mentioned, the very old one that we're most interested in. And then the split between the West African Yorubans and all of the non-African populations. And that would be a proxy for the time when these non-African groups migrated out of Africa and colonized the rest of the world. That would give us a pretty good estimate of when that colonization event might have happened. That's known as the out of Africa migration. And what we came up with after, after very careful analysis for many, many days um, was, uh, was the following estimates. We estimated the age of the sun split to be about 200,000 years ago. Now that's, that's really pretty old. So that's as old as um, Alan Wilson's estimate of mitochondrial Eve. So the sun, according to our estimates, go back about as far as mitochondrial Eve would go back. That's, that's actually not surprising. Mitochondrial Eve is the maternal ancestor, but, the, but for reasons I won't go into, it's not too surprising that the maternal ancestor would be close to the divergence time of that San split. So that was encouraging. Um, our estimate of the out of Africa event the African-Eurasian divergence, AE divergence, was 70 to 80,000 years. And that fit fairly well with uh, archaeological findings uh, in the Middle East and with uh, a number of other arguments people had made on the basis of both genetic and archaeological evidence. So we were quite encouraged by these findings. But they did indicate that the San are really quite an old population. So note that this, this time is about three times as long ago as this time. That meant the, the divergence of this San group in southern Africa was three times as old as the split between the West Africans and the Europeans. It's a very old group. There has been some gene flow between the, the West Africans and the South Africans. And we can detect that in our framework. But they've been remarkably isolated probably because of this uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle living in the desert um, and their, their tendency not to mix with the farming populations nearby. I just wanted to mention very briefly that we, um, there, there was a, a, a recent study that came out just last week. This is not yet published in a journal, but it came out on Cold Spring Harbor's preprint server known as BioArchive. This is a group that um, analyzed some similar data to the data we analyzed, but they combined it with some ancient genomes, some Iron Age farming genomes and some Stone Age hunter-gatherer genomes ranging between 300 and uh, 2,000 years old. So these were, these were remains that they dug up in South Africa obtained DNA from these remains, sequenced that DNA, and analyzed it together with modern day genomes for uh, a number of different populations. And they actually ran our program, GFOX, on these data. Um, and they also made use of their own uh, method, um, which, which analyzes only pairs of genomes together. Um, I don't want to go into all the details of their study, but they're estimating uh, that, these, th that this date for the split of the San, which are here, and the other African populations might be 260,000 years old or even older than that. Um, I have some questions about exactly how they did the analysis, so we'll see how that holds up when this paper is peer reviewed. But, um, it's reasonably consistent with ours, and it's not surprising that with the, uh, with, with the acquisition of this uh, ancient DNA, the date might get pushed back even farther. One other caveat I wanted to give here without going into a lot of detail is that this molecular clock I've been telling you about um, is actually kind of a fiction. Um, there actually isn't one molecular clock. There are many molecular clocks. The rate at which mutations occur varies across 
human individuals, and it varies quite considerably between males and females. And because of the process by which, the different processes by which sperm and egg cells are generated, it's age dependent in males and much less age dependent in females. And what that means is that uh, old males who become parents make a very disproportional contribution to the numbers of mutations that occur in their offspring. That's one of the reasons why you see a, a, a paternal age effect in diseases like autism. It's because of the higher accumulation of mutations in the sperm cells of older males. Anyway, I didn't want to go into all the details here, but I want to make the point that when we try to calibrate these dates, when we try to use genetic data to estimate how old populations are, we're using very crude averages over mutation rates across humans. And some of these factors have probably changed over time. Generation times may have changed, uh, ratio of male and female ages at the time of reproduction are, are dependent on the culture uh, in which these, uh, these reproduction is occurring, um, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of uncertainty about the precise dates that we get out of these genetic analyses. Nonetheless, we can be fairly confident about ballpark estimates. OK, in the few minutes that I have left, I want to start to talk a, a little bit about Neanderthals. Um, and I want to start by introducing you to Svante Pabo, uh, who uh, is uh, probably the, the, the most famous person in the field of Neanderthal genetics. He's been here at Cold Spring Harbor many times, given many talks about almost always about Neanderthal genetics. Not always, but almost always. Um, and uh, Svante has been um, fascinated with ancient DNA for decades and has really dedicated um, most of his career as a scientist to devising new techniques for obtaining uh, DNA from ancient samples, uh, correcting errors in that DNA, uh, and then analyzing that DNA to tell us something about uh, our history. Um, I mentioned that he worked early in his career with Alan Wilson um, at, at Berkeley. Uh, later on, he moved back to Europe, and for uh, a couple of decades now, I think, he's had his own institute in Germany, in Leipzig, Germany, uh, Max Planck Institute, um, at, where they do some of the, the, the world's best work in this field of ancient DNA. Um, so Svante had been... Uh, studying uh, Neanderthal DNA for a number of years and had some um, initial progress in obtaining uh, mitochondrial DNA from uh, Neanderthals, but also some setbacks. There had been some high profile cases where they had published uh, what they thought was Neanderthal DNA that turned out to be contaminated by modern human DNA. It's very difficult to avoid that sort of contamination. Um, and he went back to the drawing board and came up with, with more rigorous techniques for obtaining DNA. And then finally, in, in 2010, his team had a major breakthrough. They were able to obtain a, a so-called draft Neanderthal DNA sequence for an entire genome. Now, at this, at this point, they were not able to sequence too high coverage the, gen the genome of a single individual. They had to combine DNA from three bones that were found in a single cave in Croatia. They compared it with samples that they had found in some other caves across Europe. Um, but by combining this information and being very careful about DNA extraction and about sequencing and about error correction, they were able to obtain a quite good draft quality genome for a Neanderthal. And then they set about analyzing that genome. And the big story from this analysis was that there appeared to be strong evidence that Neanderthals and modern humans had interbred, probably about 60,000 years ago. I'm not going to go through all of the evidence that they presented in, in favor of this hypothesis, but I want to show you one finding that I think is quite striking um, and, and fairly easy to understand, if you'll bear with me for a moment. So what we're showing here is on the x-axis, we're, we're, we're going to take two genome sequences, a European genome sequence um, and an African genome sequence. And we're going to compare them to the newly sequenced Neanderthal genome on the x-axis, uh, 
and to the human reference genome on the y-axis. Now, the human reference genome is predominantly composed of uh, DNA from Europeans, um, but it's not the same European as the one we're comparing. So there's still going to be quite a few differences between the, the DNA, the uh, European genome that we're using as a query and this human reference genome. And now what, the, what they do for this plot is they normalize, they standardize the distances so they have an average of one. So there are some overall differences uh, between the European and the African and how similar they are to these two reference genomes, but they're going to get rid of that by adjusting them so they have averages of one. Now what you see when you look across the genome is that both the European and the African mostly have a positive slope here. Where they're, more, where they're farther away from the Neanderthal genome, they're also farther away from the human reference genome. And that just reflects the fact that the clock ticks at different rates, different places across the genome. So you're accumulating mutations at different rates at different positions across the genome. And when the clock ticks faster, you tend to be more distant both from the Neanderthal genome and from the human reference. And when it ticks more slowly, you tend to be closer to both. But Look at this strange anomaly down at the left-hand side in the European genome. So this is a collection of sequences, a small fraction of the entire genome, but a significant fraction, a collection of positions across the genome that are very close to the Neanderthal genome, to the sequence Neanderthal genome, and very far from the human reference. Okay? Sequences that look a lot like Neanderthal sequences, but are in a European individual and don't look anything like the, the reference genome that's composed of a collection of different people. So these are sort of anomalous sequences. It's like alien DNA embedded in this European genome that looks a lot like Neanderthal sequences and not like other European sequences. And it only appears in Europeans. You don't see it in Africans. It's a very strange observation. And if you do this plot with other populations from outside of Africa, such as East Asians or Americans or uh, Papua New Guineans, you see the same sort of pattern. A small fraction of sites that look a lot like Neanderthal DNA in humans. All right, so I'm not going to show you the other analyses that they did, but through a whole series of analyses, a, a large team of researchers very convincingly showed that the only plausible explanation for this strange observation in non-African genomes is that non-Africans non interbred with Neanderthals probably about 60,000 years ago after they had migrated off of the African continent. We know that it can't have happened in Africa because we see no sign of it among African populations. We also see no fossil record of Neanderthals in Africa. So Neanderthal, the Neanderthal range was predominantly in Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia. So it would make sense that this band that migrated off of the African continent would have encountered Neanderthals somewhere in Eurasia. And the only way we can explain this strange observation in a fraction of their genome is if there was an interbreeding event. Okay, so I want to go on with the story. So uh, the next chapter in this story um, was the discovery of a new cave. So this, this, this sampling of ancient DNA that Svante Pablo and his team were doing was very much limited by the quality of the DNA they were able to obtain from these these bone fragments they were analyzing. Many of the bone fragments that they found that appeared to be Neanderthal bone fragments, they couldn't extract any DNA from. And even the best ones were maybe 1 or 2 percent Neanderthal DNA, and mostly bacterial DNA and contamination from modern humans. But then they found this beautiful cave in Siberia, in the Altai Mountains, called Denisova Cave. Uh, and they teamed up with some Russian archaeologists and began to explore some uh, bones in that cave and found that they were, sorry, here it is. It's quite far to the east of these European Neanderthal findings. 
probably on, on the eastern side of the Neanderthal range. Um, but they found some beautiful bones in this cave that had astronomically higher enrichments for Neanderthal DNA than anything they had seen before. So they found in particular this one very tiny finger bone. This is uh, the distal manual phalanx, so it's the tiny little fingertip bone um, that, that had a very good DNA sample. And when they obtained the DNA from this sample, they came up with the amazing finding that it appeared not to be a Neanderthal. It appeared to be another type of archaic hominin. So it was, it was closer to a Neanderthal than it was to a modern human, but it was divergent enough from a Neanderthal that it must have been hundreds of thousands of years separated from Neanderthals. So they called that a new subspecies or species, the Denisova, named after the cave. And they also found in the same cave uh, a toe bone, um, probably from the fourth or fifth toe, uh, that was very rich in Neanderthal DNA. So these two samples then became the source of uh, the, the next several years of analysis of ancient DNA. They both were um, high enough quality that it was possible to obtain very high quality complete genome sequences for a Denisovan and for another Neanderthal from these two tiny bones, excuse me, in this cave. All right, so I can't go through all of the findings from uh, the analysis of these, of these two bones, but I want to I wanna show you a summary of what was known in about 2013 after the analysis of the complete genome sequences from these two bones. So first of all, you see there are two distinct groups, the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. They uh, are more closely related to each other than either one is to modern humans, but they're pretty distantly related to one another. Um, they probably diverged hundreds of thousands of years ago from one another. In addition, there was now evidence for several different gene flow events. There's the one that I just told you about from a Neanderthal into these out of Africa populations represented by this line here, right? Here are Africans and here are non-Africans, modern humans. That event must have happened somewhere in the branch leading to the non-Africans. In addition, they found evidence of gene flow from the Denisovan into modern humans as well. This evidence appears to be confined to East Asia. It's most strongly observed in oceanic populations, such as Papua New Guineans. Um, but you see some hints of it as well in uh, Han Chinese and Korean populations. This appears to be the result of a distinct interbreeding event between these Denisovan individuals uh, and a group that was probably on its way, migrating along the way uh, to Southeast Asia. In addition, there was uh, some weak signal indicating gene flow between the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. And then perhaps most interestingly, there was a uh, a, a sign, this remains a mystery, something that we're interested in working on in my group, there remains a sign of some as yet unknown hominin, possibly Homo erectus, which is a much earlier um, group that is known to have lived in, in China and across Eurasia. Uh, that group has left some segments in the Denisovan genome that appear very strange relative to the rest of the genome. So there are short segments in the Denisovan genome that don't look like anything else that we've sequenced, essentially. And it's possible that that represents another uh, introgression event, another interbreeding event, a very old one, but that remains an open question. Okay, so this is all the background to the story that I'm gonna tell you about from my group, very briefly, and there, this story involved using this program that I just told you about, GFOX, to jointly analyze all of the data that was available at this time. So uh, we had now three Neanderthal genome sequences, the ones from the first paper, the ones from the second paper, and then a partial genome that had not yet been published from a cave in Spain. 
we had the Denisovan genome, and then we had a series of modern humans whose genomes had been obtained. I'm using the Yoruban here as a placeholder, but we analyzed several of them together. We put them into this GFOX program that samples over all of the possible evolutionary histories that could explain the data. And after some careful analysis, we came up with the following model. So GFOX detected evidence of essentially all of the uh, gene flow events that I just told you about. So for example, um, here's the gene flow event from Neanderthals to the out of Africa populations. Here's, here are the gene flow events from Denisovans to East Asians and Papua New Guineans. Here is that mysterious archaic hominin that might be Homo erectus introgression. Here is the introgression between the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, detected at quite low levels. But in addition, we found another introgression event. And no matter how we did the analysis, no matter how careful we were, no matter how we subsetted the data, we couldn't get this one to go away. And this one is quite interesting. It's going in the opposite direction. It suggests some early modern human from before the divergence of Europeans and Africans left its imprint in the Neanderthal genomes. Remember, the, uh, the event I told you about earlier was in the opposite direction. It was Neanderthals leaving a footprint in out of Africa human genomes. This is humans leaving a footprint in Neanderthal genomes, but it's shared across all humans. It's not present just in the out of Africa populations. It's, uh, you see the same signal essentially symmetrically in all modern humans. So it must date to a, to a time before the divergence of these human populations. And it appears only in this easternmost Neanderthal genome, the Altai Neanderthal genome. So this is really a mystery. How can we explain this observation? Well, here's our best guess at coming up with a scenario that might describe it. So first of all, if we, if we think about the human lineage, about 600,000 years ago, in Africa, the Neanderthals would have branched off and they would have migrated off of the African continent. This is very early. Sometime later, around 200,000 years ago, just before these different African groups began to split apart from one another, the San and the West Africans, for example, there must have been a group that interbred with Neanderthals. Now the question is, where could that have happened? Because we don't think Neanderthals at that stage lived on the African continent. So it suggests maybe there was an earlier migration out of Africa, an interbreeding event with Neanderthals, perhaps in the Middle East or east of the Caspian Sea leading to that easternmost Neanderthal lineage. And then who knows what happened to that group of modern humans, that group of early modern humans. We don't see any representatives of them alive today, but they could have been absorbed by the Neanderthals. They could have died out completely, or they could have migrated back and become absorbed by the other African populations. We don't know. We just know that we see no sign of them. And then sometime later, going back to about 65,000 years or so, there would have been the main migration out of Africa, the so-called out of Africa event, and subsequently, the interbreeding event that had already been discovered by Svante Pavo and his colleagues in the opposite direction from Neanderthals into modern humans. So this was the subject of our paper a couple of years ago. There are a lot of questions about exactly how this could have happened, but the genetic evidence is very strong that there was at least one interbreeding event in the other direction from early modern humans into Neanderthals. Okay. So I apologize for going long. I'm going to wrap up there. Um, the main point I want to make is that we can uh, take use of the, we can make use of these classical molecular phylogenetic techniques to study complete genome sequences and reconstruct human history. It's computationally expensive, requires supercomputers and very sophisticated computational models, but we can do it and we can come up with new discoveries including these ancient interbreeding events 
The, the other point I wanted to make is that simultaneously modeling all of the data gives us a lot of useful information. So most of the previous work published by Svante Pabo and others has looked at subsets of the data in isolation. This finding that we were able to publish uh, a year ago was made possible by the fact that we, we came up with a single model that had to explain all of the data together. And we could only see evidence of this early interbreeding event in the opposite direction from early modern humans into Neanderthals after we were accounting for all of the signals of the other migration events. It was only by building a holistic model that described all of the data together that we were able to discover that event. Um, and as I mentioned, we've, we've found the first evidence of early modern human gene flow into Neanderthals. And they suggest a likely possibility of an earlier migration out of Africa, although we have no other evidence to support that finding other than the timing, the inferred timing of the event. So finally, what's next? Well, we're very interested in understanding that uh, sort of phantom uh, introgression event uh, in the Denisovan genome, those hints of some very early introgression event, possibly from Homo erectus. I have a student in my lab who's working very hard on trying to build models that can detect those early events. We're also very interested in coming up with ways of detecting specific introgressed segments, specific segments in the human genome that have come from Neanderthals and Denisovans. And I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but it's very interesting to think about the possible uh, disease-causing mutations that are um, out there in modern human populations that may have been inherited from Neanderthals. Because these Neanderthals had adapted to a different genetic background. They had adapted uh, much earlier to the climate uh, um, and conditions of uh, northern Europe um, and Asia. Um, and, um, and those mutations that they passed to modern humans through this integration event some of them were probably advantageous, but some of them were probably disease-causing mutations. So there's a lot of interest in trying to understand which mutations now linked to disease might have come into our populations through these introgression events. OK, I'm going to stop there. So I'd like to thank all the members of my lab who have contributed to this work, uh, as well as our uh, collaborators. Um, and uh, I, I've had a, a number of funding sources over the years who've allowed us to pursue um, these sorts of questions. Thank you very much.